Doing for Profit program. Um, and for those that you, of you that didn't join us last week, this um, series is all about um, creating a positive and future-focused webinar series looking at current and future opportunities for red meat farmers in central Otago. But um, a lot of the lessons from these um, events will be equally applicable uh, New Zealand-wide. I'm Nicola Chisholm. I facilitate the Beef and Lamb Central Otago Farming for Profit and I'll be um, hosting tonight's webinar. Um, last week we had a session on adding value to red meat, which will be available as a podcast in the next week or two and we'll post a link out to those that registered and also on our Central Otago Farming for Profit Facebook page for those that didn't attend. Tonight, our focus is on opportunities for carbon sequestration on sheep and beef farms, and you'll be hearing from two fantastic speakers. We've got Erica Van Reenen from Ag First and David Norton, who um, has just retired from the University of Canterbury. Also in the background, we've got Dean Cinnamon, um, the new extension manager for Beef and Lamb New Zealand. He's um, working on some of the tech stuff for us. Just a couple of rules before we get started. If you could turn your cameras off and also make sure your mics are off for the duration of the webinar, that would be great. If you've got any questions, just hover your mouse and um, click on the chat box down the bottom of your screen and you can type any questions that you've got into there. We'll address questions at the end of the webinar after the speakers have completed their presentations. Um, and again, this webinar will be available for viewing afterwards um, for those that register and also for others via, via the Central Otago Farming for Profit Facebook page. Um, righto, I'll introduce our first speaker. So we're very privileged tonight to be joined by Erica Van Reenen. Erica is an agribusiness and environment consultant for Egg First based in the Manawatu Whanganui region. As well as her role as a consultant and a farmer, Erica's been leading the sequestration work stream for Hewaka Ekanoa. So she's got a really in-depth knowledge um, of the sequestration options being put forward, as well as some practical insight into the opportunities for sequ sequestration on sheep and beef farms. Um, she's going to provide some insight into the opportunities offered by Hewaki he Ikenoa um, for farmers to recognise a broader range of woody vegetation offsets on farms. I'll hand over to you, Erica. Thanks, Nicola. I uh, just got kicked out, so that was good timing that I came back in right at the end here. Um, hopefully my broadband holds out. Like the rest of you, I'm, uh, I'm rural, so we'll give this a crack. All right. Um, Kia ora everyone. I'm the final um, final few weeks um, of that. So on the second of June, there'll be a launch, um, and uh, all of the recommendations that Hewaka Ikenoa will be making will be publicly available then. So um, keep your eyes peeled. I don't think you'll have to look very far. I'm sure it will be picked up by um, rural media and so on, um, probably mainstream media as well. So I'm going to give you a very um, whirlwind tour um, of sequestration um, opportunities on sheep and beef farms. Um, I'll give a little bit of context, um, talk about the ETS versus um, what's proposed for Hewaka Ikenoa, um, and then just give you a very brief rundown on um, opportunities that you have and that's something that you can do right now um, to start thinking about it. Um, just in terms of, oh, I'll get into that in a minute. All right, so um, just really brief uh, context around why we're de dealing with this. Um, climate change a global issue. Um, I, I'm not going to get into the science of it because we've only got 20 minutes. Um, but just wanted to put this up here that just shows um, what we're trying to achieve. So under the Paris Agreement, um, that was for a 1.5 um, degree um, reduction, or basically that uh, the minimum that we can um, can reach is 1.5 degrees. Um, if you look at this, this is the climate action tracker that's global based on um, everything that's that's currently in action. Uh, we're, look, we're heading towards a, a 2.7 degrees. Optimistically, we might get to the 1.5. Uh, 
the general consensus is that we're now looking at um, at probably two degrees warming. So that's pretty significant. Um, and that's why we need to do something about it. Um, in New Zealand, this is um, from the Royal Society. This is actual from uh, 2015, number of days exceeding 25 degrees. Um, so if you if you have it, just keep your eyes peeled on Central Otago, which is um, what I'm sure you'll be looking at. Uh, the forecast for 2050 um, sees quite a quite a jump there in in days exceeding 25 degrees, and then we hit um, some pretty scary um, scary times come 2100. Uh, probably most of you won't be around for that, so uh, not going to be such an issue for you, but um, but certainly your children. So. That's, um, that's what's forecast. Um, we're already seeing the impacts of um, climate change across New Zealand. Um, and this um, past few months has been pretty dramatic already in um, several parts of the country. All right, so in terms of government response, um, we're, we're in the zone at the moment of, um, of not quite knowing where it's all gonna land. What we do know is that uh, emissions will be priced by 2025. There's two ways that that could happen. One is through the emissions trading scheme. The emissions trading scheme's been operative since 2008. Um, the, um, all, basically all other sectors of the emitting sectors of the economy and forestry are in the ETS now and have been since 2008. Uh, most of those sectors have um, had a what's called a free allocation uh, that have, has reduced the impact or the price based um, there's a bunch of other mechanisms within the ETS that have controlled price uh, over the years. Um, those mechanisms are being e um, eased off. I'll say eased off. They're still kind of being eased off. So there's a price cap uh, still in existence. Um, government are still, are still hold a number of units so they can control the market um, to an extent. Uh, current, current carbon price is sitting at around $70 a tonne. It was just over $80 a tonne just at Christmas time, um, the uh, Ukraine-Russia um, uh, war had, an, had a bit of an impact and also the proposed um, changes that are going through at the moment with the ETS that could limit um, pine being treated as a permanent forest. Uh, the alternative, which has been what's been worked on for the past two years uh, is Hewaka Ekenoa, which means, uh, translates to we're all in this together. So all primary sector organisations signed up to Hewaka Ekenoa um, to basically design and propose an alternative to the emissions trading scheme. Um, and as I said, they'll be making their final recommendations uh, in the next um, few weeks. So under Hewaka Ekenoa, um, all farmers will face a price on their emissions. Um, there's, that could either be at the farm level or the processor level. Um, the processor level would be an interim measure as a transition to farm level. Um, the uh, strong preference across um, all of the sectors is for farm level, um, and that came through strongly in the recent, um, recent engagement that was had with farmers as well, which hopefully many of you engaged with. Um, basically what that means is for us on farm, uh, we face a price, on our emissions, lose our sequestration, and I'll talk about what sequestration is being proposed um, shortly. Uh, there are eight, um, updates occurring at the moment to the emissions trading scheme. Um, the big ones are around um, how pine is treated. Um, and it, so just to be clear, pine will still be able to be entered into the ETS. It will just be under what's called averaging rather than um, in the permanent category where it just keeps accumulating carbon um, in perpetuity uh, and makes it very um, appetizing to plant and walk away, which is what we're seeing um, not so much down, down your way, but a lot up in the North Island here with um, wholesale farms, beautiful farms getting um, sold into, um, into carbon forestry. Uh, also pending, as I'm sure you're aware, is, uh, is more certainty around freshwater regulations, um, hopefully some certainty around biodiversity regulations, and David might touch on those soon. Um, and there's also RMA reform, which I'm sure will touch egg sector um, significantly as well. So always good to be aware of what's coming down our way. It's usually a lot. 
All right, so getting into sequestration. Um, under the ETS, uh, the ETS for forestry, so for any sequestration that's rewarded in the ETS, needs to meet the definition of a forest. The de definition of a forest is an international definition, and it's also the definition we use for our accounting. So when we're account, we're, when we do our inventory and we talk about whether we're meeting targets or not, it's not based on what's in the ETS, it's based on um, a, a, another process that runs in parallel um, in the inventory. But to ensure consistency, um, the ETS uses the same definition of a forest effectively so that any new forest going into the ETS can also count towards our targets. That definition is that it needs to be greater than a hectare, greater than five metres in height at maturity, um, which is tricky in a central Otago climate, um, greater than 30% canopy cover at maturity and also greater than 30 metres wide on average. It also has to have been established since 1 January 1990. Um, from 2023 onwards, um, the um, ETS will primarily use what's called averaging. That's basically where um, forestry accumulates carbon up to the long-term average carbon stock. Um, so if you think about it, a pine forest, um, I should have had a, you'll have to watch my finger, hopefully you can all see it. But um, basically you start accumulating carbon and then you get to the harvest and so you lose all the carbon uh, and then it starts accumulating again. So that's what's called sawtooth accounting. The long-term average basically just draws a line through all of that um, at the long-term average um, carbon stock point. Um, for pines, that's about 16 years. Douglas fir is 26 years, Yerkes are 12. So just to give you a, a sense of where those lie. Um, if your pines went for longer than what um, what the average um, age is, which I think is based on a 28 year cycle, um, you would get a top up under the averaging system. Also that averaging can only apply for the first cycle. So it can only apply um, in the first harvest cycle. So it needs to be new, uh, basically new plantings where that can, um, can be uh, rewarded. Um, and then you earn a unit for every ton of sequestration that you get and those units go into an account and you can trade those units or sell those units um, and uh, play the market as you see fit. And there's liabilities if your forest is removed and some hefty penalties as well in the ETS for breaking the rules. Um, um, uh, a bit of a misnomer is that um, natives are not eligible for the ETS. They are, but only if they meet that definition. So um, that can be quite difficult for some of our um, slower growing areas, such as dryland central Otago. Um, and obviously they also have to be more recent, so established since, um, since 1 January 1990. So regenerating um, native can go into that category. Um, poplars as well, um, so erosion planting, which um, is more common up our way than down there, um, but um, there are other exotics that can go into the ETS. Another thing that's quite uh, critical that lots of farmers don't realise is that any pre-1990 exotics that you have on your farm, so if you've got a, um, an old um, block of pine, say, um, that is that was established before uh, 1990, so um, that 1990 is critical there. If you take it out, uh, you face a liability and um, if you don't replace it. So if it's replaced, uh, no problem, but, um, but it does face a liability otherwise. And so if you're in that position, I strongly encourage you to get, uh, make sure that you know what the rules are. Have a look on the MPI website um, around ETS liabilities for pre-1990 exotics and make sure that you're um, covering anything that might need to be covered. So that's ETS. Um, so really good opportunity there, um, especially at, um, at $70 plus a tonne of uh, carbon can get some pretty good income, um, albeit it's only for that one hit. So 16 years, unless it's natives that are eligible, in which case you can keep generating an income from them for, um, for a long time, well past your lifetimes. Okay, so Hiwaki Kinoa. Um, 
the basically, as I as I mentioned already, um, that will be emissions less sequestration. So the equation that's kind of been used is A plus B minus C. So A is methane, B is nitrous oxide. So those are your two sources of emissions: methane, nitrous oxide, less sequestration, which is your C. And here I've also got less incentives. So there is um, proposed to be incentive payments as well for taking up mitigation technologies. Um, so there'll, there'll be reward for that as well. So with a bit of luck, that's, um, that's zero or positive. Um, at this point, uh, if you have more sequestration than emissions, um, which doesn't apply to very many farmers, um, but, um, but may apply to some, some farmers, also could work well in a collective. Collectives are allowed. So that may create an opportunity for you as well, where you could uh, work with um, with a group of other farmers, uh, pull your, your sequestration resources um, and um, and make it work for you in, within your collective. The only condition of a collective is it has to be a legal entity. So in terms of the sequestration that's proposed to be recognized under Hewaka Ekenoa, um, reasonably confident that this will, will go through. Um, uh, we've had pretty widespread support across the partnership and with government for all of these categories. Um, there might be the odd odd thing that changes, but, um, but it's looking pretty positive that this will be what is recognised. Whether it's all recognised from 2025 or not, uh, that remains to be seen. It's a huge um, build to get everything underway by 2025. So you may see a bit of a transition period where um, potentially this stuff isn't all on the table straight away. So a couple of things. Firstly, uh, 2008 was chosen as the baseline rather than 1990 um, because it's more recent, therefore more much better quality aerial imagery available um, means that every farmer um, in the country can jump online and see what whether um, their land was in pasture on 31st of December 2007 um, or not. And um, so it, it's much more accessible than um, the current 1990, which is very difficult to prove with very poor imagery available. However, through the consultation period, um, farmers feedback back pretty strongly that they didn't like 2008. Uh, and so provision is likely to be made where you can provide evidence that it was established between 1990 and 2008. Um, for, you can be rewarded for that. So uh, you might see that coming through in the RECs as well. Um, so there's uh, a, a big win was that we were able to recognise pre-2008 or pre-1990, if you are familiar with the terms, uh, native vegetation. Um, strong focus for Hiwaki Ekenoi has been natives, um, basically recognising that there's a whole lot of significant values of natives in our farm systems um, and it aligns with, with integrated uh, vegetation in our landscapes and so hence the strong focus on natives. Um, so reward for pre-2008 native um, can only be done if there's uh, additionality. So um, there needs to be an action taken that leads to additional sequestration over and above what would have happened business as usual. Since 1990 is our uh, national and international accounting line, uh, then additional is either post-1990 or, um, or a management action is taken. So to get a standard management action across the board that we could apply, that stock exclusion. Now I appreciate that there are environments where stock exclusion is particularly challenging to achieve, uh, particularly in some of the landscapes that um, I see a number of um, familiar names on this call have, uh, where um, you might have some really nice regenerating pre-1990 pre or pre-2008 native, uh, where stock are grazing it and it's still doing its thing. Um, we had to find a line somewhere and it has to be have environmental integrity and it has to be uh, easily proven. Um, and so stock exclusion was chosen there. There is um, a potential for, um, if you can prove active management that is leading to good, um, generally good uh, ecological outcomes, which David will talk about, um, ecological outcomes strongly linked to carbon outcomes. And so 
there may be a window there. But basically, if it's stock exclusion, pre, if it's stock excluded, pre-1990 native, um, you can get a small reward for it on an annual basis. Uh, stock exclusion doesn't necessarily have to be a fence. Uh, it could be a very dense piece of vegetation, which usually occurs if it's quite large, uh, or often will occur that way. Or if you've got a geographic boundary, such as a bluff or a gorge um, or a gully, um, where stock are, are not going into it because of geography, that's okay. A fence obviously will also do the job. Uh, in terms of the other categories, um, the rest all need to be established since 2008 or prove that it was uh, since 1990 um, to receive a reward. So um, the next two are the post-2008 native. Um, and so basically that's all native that, that was established post-2008. That can be regenerating or planted um, and also riparian um, vegetation as well. Those three, those top three, um, are our permanent categories and effectively um, there's, there's the reward goes um, in perpetuity or for a long time um, until the vegetation reaches steady state, which is somewhere for native around two to 300 years old. We're not quite sure when that happens and it's different for different vegetation types. So those are the permanent categories. For riparian, it's got to be wider than a metre, metre think to, um, to edge of vegetation. Um, it needs to be predominantly woody, so uh, it's okay if it's got a bit of flax and toy toy in it, for example, but uh, it needs to be at least 50% woody. So if you are doing any riparian planting, um, you need to be thinking about getting those woody species in uh, as quickly as possible. I know and um, in some of your environments, you might have to use some, um, some more grassy shrubby species initially to get the, um, the environment suitable for that, that woody vegetation to come through. So this is a long-term game. Um, and, and so that's the kind of planning we need to be doing if we're looking at this. Uh, obviously not predominantly weeds. Um, none of the height restrictions exist in the Hiwaka Ekenoa definitions. Uh, neither do the um, width definitions apart from riparian um, and neither does the canopy cover definition. So basically, um, or, or, the, or the size one, so um, 0.25 hectares is the minimum, um, but you can aggregate up small parcels to get your minimum of 0.25 hectares if, uh, if that's what you choose to do. For our cyclical categories, so those are um, those are the four down the bottom. Um, we've got these small woodlots, and it's small basically because um, once, oh sorry, I should say, with any of these categories, once they meet the definition of uh, vegetation for the ETS, they're no longer eligible. So, um, so it's likely to only be small ones that um, fit the, the. I know it got kind of shorthand in the consultation where. Um, basically it was small woodlots as long as they're less than a hectare. You could actually have a 10 hectare woodlot in here if it was if it didn't meet one of the other ETS criteria, like let's say it wasn't, it was only 20 metres wide. Um, so yeah, although that would be a very big woodlot um, by area. So um, it's not quite just less than a hectare, it's that def full definition. Um, so small woodlots, that's fairly obvious. Scattered trees, um, that uh, needs to be at least 15 stems per hectare, which is not very many when you count them up if you look on a map. Things like amenity plantings and um, in lanes or paddocks, uh, uh, erosion control planting, um, yeah, shade and sheltered plantings. There's lots of different types of scattered trees that we've got across our landscapes. Um, shelter belts, um, also can come into here and then perennial cropland. So if you've got an orchard, you might decide you want to chuck that in here as well. Just a reminder that all of those needles have been established since 2008. Uh, and those, um, those cyclical categories are not eligible once they meet the ETS definition. The other thing with cyclical is it uses the averaging methodology that I've already talked about. And that means that you only get up to the long-term carbon uh, average carbon stock because these are generally 
um, either planted and harvested or they're planted and replaced when trees uh, fall over or, or die. Um, so, um, yeah, it's uh, it's basically a one hit wonder. It's going to be be your generation that gets this, uh, not the next one. Um, and I'll talk about long term uh, liability in the in this in a minute. So that's the the set of um, vegetation that's proposed to be recognised, which is quite broad. It still doesn't um, doesn't count every tree uh, and every growing tree, um, but with all policy, there's um, there's compromise that has to be made. So we, um, we've tried to get a good coverage um, of vegetation that's not currently rewarded by the ETS um, and obviously dominated by that um, sequestration that's from native where possible. Um, so oh yeah, I'll jump into this. So just in terms of um, what you can do, the thing with the responding to emissions, so I know, I know this is about sequestration, but the thing with the responding to emissions is, um, is it's quite important to have a plan and it's not like water where, or dealing with water quality, where we can take an action and we can see an outcome from that action uh, generally relatively quickly. It might take a few years, but we still see that, um, that outcome. With emissions, because they're biological and um, driven by feed intake, quality of feed, and uh, in our fertilizer use, um, we can end up changing one thing in our farm system that may reduce emissions in the area that we think it will, that can lead to an increase elsewhere. So it's actually really important to have good detailed planning. Also, any sequestration that you're gonna get, be rewarded for, whether it's in Hewaki Kenoa emissions trading scheme or through the voluntary market, there's an expectation of permanence. And so you need to really think about that vegetation as a permanent land use change. So, um, so it's really important to have, have a plan. The key elements of a plan from my perspective are that you're thinking about your personal family um, goals and your business goals, what, your, what stakeholder expectations are if relevant. So if you're, if you're in a, um, a business where you've got shareholders, for example, what are your base resources and your constraints? So what, what's your natural resources? Uh, what are your human resources? What are your capital resources? What constraints do you have? Uh, regulatory constraints should be considered here. Environmental constraints such as climate to, um, and also capital constraints or access to capital. Then look at what your emissions are, what's driving your emissions. And then you can look at your response, uh, what options are available to you. And sequestration is one part, should be one part of that response, um, not necessarily the only part. So um, I just thought I'd, I'd pop that in so that you've got something that you can um, anchor to make decisions around sequestration in a framework. So in terms of sequestration options, um, think about, uh, so you'll, you'll have existing vegetation on your farm. Some of it may be ETS eligible. Um, if it is, then it's, it's an opportunity to look at whether that is an option for you. Um, I've also outlined what the Hewaka Ekenau um, vegetation is, and that hasn't changed from the consultation document that went out um, in February. So if you want to jump on the Hewaka Ekenau website, um, I'm sure Nicola will check it in the um, in the follow up that goes out. Um, I'll put it in the chat shortly. Um, so you can have a look on there to get the detailed definitions. Um, there's also the voluntary market and uh, you yourselves, or you might know people who are getting reward through voluntary market. Some of the meat companies are starting to, um, to reward carbon neutral beef, for example, through salt firm farms. Um, that means they're counting vegetation that's on those properties um, as part of that claim. You can't double count. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't be accounting for it in the voluntary market and also accounting for it in Hiwaka Ekenawa, for example. So you need to choose. Um, so it is important that you understand what the pros and cons of each of those different options are. 
Uh, obviously, if it's a voluntary market, you'll be expecting uh, good uh, compensation for what's going in there that may help offset some of your liabilities based um, once we face a price on our emissions in 2025. As I've said, you need to really consider the need for permanence. So it's not necessarily that the tree stays in the ground forever. There are options obviously to harvest and replant, but that replanting is critical. Um, and particularly with natives, basically once it's in, uh, it's pretty unlikely that we'll be able to ever get it out again. Um, some regions you can still, still um, clear native vegetation without penalty, um, most you can't. And, likely under the new biodiversity statement that we won't be able to either. Um, but vegetation provides a really strong opportunity to integrate trees into the landscape, um, providing co-benefits such as biodiversity, water, uh, dealing, helping support fresh, clean fresh water, um, and also regulating water flow, um, as well as shade and shelter. So um, think about your options. You don't have to just think about natives. Um, David's going to give you some great um, insights into native vegetation in your environment. Um, but yeah, think think quite carefully about, um, about the options and what else you can achieve. So it's not a cheap exercise to take land out, um, regenerate it or plant it. Um, so make sure you get the best bang for your buck. So last slide, um, just encourage you to get your information together and um, get a plan and Beef and Lamb run some great um, climate change workshops, so I encourage you to get along to those. Um, you'll figure out your number, understand what drives your emissions and look at some of these opportunities as well. Um, once you've got all your base information, you can look at the options you've got for sequestration. Um, I do encourage farm system modeling. Um, FarmX is a great tool for that. That helps you look at your policy options from an emissions perspective and can help identify areas that might be better suited to sequestration. Um, and the final bit is if you're getting people coming into your, getting experts coming into your farms, just really make sure that they have a good understanding of your farm system context because it is unique, uh, the challenges are unique, um, and um, it's, it's critical that, that you're getting the right advice to make, uh, to respond to any price on emissions, planting trees for, for permanent land use, um, and that you're not pulling the wrong levers to achieve the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. So I think that's me. Awesome, thanks thanks for that Erica. Um, I realise we've gone slightly over time with that but that was really awesome content and you've done well to distill it down into a 20 minute section so well done and I'm sure um, that you've all got plenty of questions for Erica so again if you do want to ask something just pop it in the chat box down below and we'll um, try and address as many of those as we can at the end of the webinar. Um, right up we're going to get on to David's presentation now so um, as I mentioned earlier, I'll just do a wee intro to David. He is a recently retired professor of, um, at the University of Canterbury. So his specialties include um, forestry, conservation and ecology. And he's got a wealth of experience working with farmers to develop ecological plans for their properties, um, as well as a good working knowledge of what's required to support healthy native vegetation. Um, so he's going to talk to us about sequestering carbon um, through native vegetation. So thanks, David. I'll hand over to you. Great. Thank, thanks very much, um, Nicola. That's, that's, that's good. So um, I'm going to talk about, um, hopefully everybody can see my screen okay. Um, I'm going to talk about sequestering carbon through native vegetation and touch on um, you know, some of the issues around how we might do that, focusing on sort of Central Otago, Southern Lakes area. Just a brief background, um, I worked at the University of Canterbury for nearly 40 years. Um, I retired at the start of the year. I now actually reside at Lake Hawea. Um, my background is in ecology and uh, biodiversity conservation. And probably over the last two decades, I've been mainly working with farmers around how we can get win-win outcomes for biodiversity, um, native biodiversity within farming systems. And so that's included, um, I wrote the biodiversity module in the uh, Beef and Lamb Farm Plan um, and do a lot of work with, with farmers uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis around farm management planning. Um, oops, hang on. Just... So what I want to um, cover today, re really the key points I'm going to talk about, and I'll summarise them now, then go through in more detail, 
Um, clearly native plants can sequester carbon and, and Eric has talked about that, um, but the rates are slower than exotics in, in many most cases. But it's also important, and again, Erica hinted on this one as well, it's also important to recognize that um, native vegetation has a range of other values, um, not just carbon, especially in terms of biodiversity conservation and, and of course for aesthetics. So there can be a whole range of win-win of outcomes um, from looking at native vegetation in the carbon space. Um, and it's worth just commenting, as Erica mentioned, there is a national policy statement on biodiversity sitting somewhere in the wings. Um, it may be out June, July this year. There, there are some, um, uh, it's hard to know exactly when, and it will certainly uh, have a number of uh, influences on how you might manage native vegetation on, on your farms, particularly existing native vegetation. So in terms of the ways to facilitate um, native vegetation for carbon and biodiversity, it's either working with natural regeneration, so things like Karnaka uh, would be a good example of that, or it's through going out there and deliberately planting Kofai Tōtara Beach or, or whatever is appropriate to your particular area. And, and I guess my, my sort of take home message with, with, with all of that, and I'll come back to this at the end, is that to do this with natives, it requires good planning and good management, controlling grazing animals, both livestock and feral animals, invasive weeds, uh, reducing um, water loss of planting, particularly in dry environments, so thinking very carefully about what you plant and how you're going to manage um, dry conditions, uh, thinking about the potential of using enrichment of existing stands to speed up the carbon sequestration, and of course incorporating all of that into um, your farm management planning. So just to give you an example of what is possible, um, this is a project that's in North Canterbury, so it's a, it's a, it's a much um, uh, wetter environment than perhaps in central Otago, but this is a, a restoration project um, associated with the uh, Canterbury Regional Landfill at Cape Valley. Um, and I've included a photo pair here over um, 2005, the top photograph in 2021, and just showing through active um, management of native vegetation, the sort of changes we can see on the ground. So that hillside in, in the back, and particularly the area I've highlighted in yellow, has gone from predominantly pasture and into predominantly woody vegetation over that time. And in fact, if you look at the whole hillside, you can see it's really thickened up um, through primarily removal of, of grazing animals out of that system. And then the other thing in this photograph with the red circle around it just shows the, um, the uh, result of doing restoration plantings and actually directly uh, establishing native woody vegetation into that system. In terms of how well natives go, um, um, don't look too closely at the data straight away, but um, the general point is that in ideal conditions, native vegetation can perform well, although it will never perform as well as radiata, at least for that first 30, 40, 50 years. So this is data from Tane's Tree Trust. They've got a lot of information on um, native um, vegetation and, and restoring native vegetation. This is from East Cape. So it's obviously a warm and high rainfall environment. The red line is for, um, for radiata, for um, ton, ton, tons of carbon um, sequestered per hectare. And the top um, diagram looks at natural regeneration, both with um, Karnaka uh, and with um, Totara. Um, and you can see that the rates are lower than for radiata, but they're still, particularly for Totara, are still very um, comparable, but it is taking at least twice as long to get the same amount of carbon sequestered. The bottom diagram is, is an interesting one. Um, it's again the same red line for radiata, again East Cape data, um, but this time for planted stands of um, uh, Totara and Kauri. Um, and in this case, it's showing um, rates of carbon sequestration still slower than radiata, but certainly a lot more comparable. Um, and I think Tane's Tree Trust in particular are, are very uh, strong advocates for the, for the potential of natives, if they manage well, to be able to um, at least perform comparably to exotics, not as well as exotics, but certainly uh, more comparably. Of course, in central Otago, um, it's drier, it's colder, and up into the southern lakes here, it's colder. Um, so clearly there'll be less carbon sequestered than, than East Cape, um, but the same applies for exotics. Exotics will also perform less well. But I, I think there's a lot of encouraging um, data coming out now that is showing us that natives can perform quite well. 
And then when we think about the role of natives, just to reiterate the point I made before, um, native vegetation also has really important biodiversity values. So not only are you, by looking after native vegetation or planting native vegetation, are you sequestering carbon, but you're also looking after biodiversity. Um, this is on um, oh, the end of the um, Dunstan Mountains, um, uh, Thinbark Totara, uh, growing amongst rock outcrops, you know, clearly very high um, native biodiversity values. So what are the pathways for bringing uh, more native vegetation to both sequester carbon and, and for biodiversity conservation? Um, so natural regeneration, um, in the top example here on, on the Pisa range, uh, Karnaka establishing into um, abandoned pasture, um, and Karnaka and other cereal species, depending where you are, if you're in a higher rainfall area, broadleaf, um, three finger or five finger, pittosporums, there's a whole range of species can establish, and if managed properly can gradually move a system through towards a more mature and, and long-term native forest state with, in the long-term, substantial carbon sequestration. The other approach is to go out there and actually plant it yourself. Um, the example at the bottom is, is from that North Canterbury Terramoana bush um, project again. Uh, this is a kaikatea forest restoration, um, and those little green um, covers are actually around kaikatea seedlings uh, planted into an area with, with, with cabbage trees and harakiki and, and other plants there. So they're the two options. The cost, though, it's important to be aware of the cost. There's a really good survey was done last year looking at costs of both of these options. For restoration plantings, um, on average, for a 1.5 metre spacing, we are looking at something like between $22,000 and $28,000 a hectare, and that doesn't include fencing and pest control. Uh, maintenance, is, so that's just doing weed control after planting, might be two to $600 a hectare for the first two or three years. Natural regeneration really is, is a lot less. It's just fencing and pest control, um, although that can be quite substantial, particularly if there is an ongoing problem with, with, with feral deer and goats and the like, pigs, et cetera. If you want to look at taking a Karnaka stand, like in the top um, diagram there, and enriching it to try and speed up the, um, the return to mature forest, so you might want to plant totara into it or beech into it to try and get to a, a more mature forest state quicker, that can cost seven to $15,000 a hectare. And I'm happy to make that, that um, cost um, report. It's an NPI report um, available um, through um, Nicola as well. Just looking at what, what can happen. Um, one of the key things of natural regeneration is getting livestock or keeping livestock out. Um, this is a Karnaka stand on the top left here. Uh, first photograph was taken in 2008. It had livestock removed in 2006. Um, 10 years later, you can see it's got very, very dense uh, regeneration in the understory of Mahoe, but also five finger lancewood and a number of other species. But um, there is often a need because seed sources aren't available or because you want to move the system on more rapidly to potentially enrich stands like that to try and move them towards a more mature state more quickly. So this is a, a trial down the bottom right here where we're planting um, totara into a Karnaka stand to try and speed that process up. And then just to show you some restoration data, and look, there's a whole lot of this data out there. Um, the top photograph is for one of those um, um, stands illustrated in the, um, the diagram in the bottom left, um, just showing height growth over 10 years for restoration planting. We've gone from, you know, 30, 40 centimetre seedlings. 10 years later, we're looking at um, a tree canopy around five to six metres, and, and it will continue to move upwards. Um, so you can see in the bottom right there, the heights for, for three plots, just established in restoration plantings, all, all, all established in 2008. So 3.75 to 5.48 metres and getting very good canopy cover. Um, the grass is, is gradually disappearing from the stands. And we're starting to see in the top right hand photograph, other native plants establishing into that stand to move that forest forward uh, towards a more mature state. So that's a, a five finger seedling there that's self seeded into that restoration planting. But um, if we're going to, if we want to use natural regeneration or restoration, we need to we need to manage the stands. I mean, we can't just plant them or leave them and walk away; that they will not perform. And this is what um, Erica was hinting at around the requirement for stock exclusion. But I'd suggest it's more than that. Um, the top left-hand diagram shows a restoration planting that's really struggling against coxfoot growth. So thinking very hard about controlling. Um, 
the pasture both before uh, and then after planting to make sure the plants can get away. Coxwood's a terrible plant at um, slowing down uh, restoration plantings. Ungulates, feral ungulates are a massive issue throughout New Zealand. They've become a, a they've really become a major problem in the last decade, uh, and it really alarms me wherever I visit. Um, this seeing the signs of deer and, and talking to farmers about the increasing numbers of deer. But deer, of course, um, the bottom left hand example is a, um, a ribbonwood that's just been um, stripped and then snapped um, by by deer. Um, obviously, fencing to keep uh, livestock out. Um, that's a grazed carnica stand, and I showed you the example before. Um, and then in terms of restoration plantings, and particularly in dry climates, so I'm not suggesting this bottom right photograph um, is kaikatea. I'm not suggesting we plant kaikatea necessarily in central Otago, but putting guards around them using uh, various types of mulches um, to try and improve soil moisture. Retaining soil moisture is really critical for good restoration, particularly in drier climates. I think it's also really important when we think about restoration that we don't think about it on its own, that we think about it in the context of the landscape. Um, we need to be thinking about where are the best sites for restoration? How does it integrate into, um, into the farming system? What are the best sites for biodiversity? What are the best sites for carbon outcomes and how they integrate? And I mean, this is just hypothetical, but we might have um, plantings on valley floors where it's moister. We might have natural reversion, regeneration on south facing hill slopes, but thinking about it in the, at the scale of the farm. So, so really thinking how it fits together uh, at the farm scale, I think is important as well. And then I think it's really important to build this into farm environment planning. So either the uh, farm plan environment module uh, from Beef and Lamb or the Farm Assurance Program Plus standard, they're both based on the same bit of work I did, um, which, which gives you a, a way to think about how your restoration or how your natural regeneration fits in to make sure you're setting goals, um, to stage the work to make it financially possible to do uh, uh, and fitting all that together. And I think photo points, and again, this is an example, again, over that 2006 um, um, to 2021, I think, time period at Turramina Bush in North Canterbury, photo points are a wonderful tool for monitoring uh, what's happening on the ground. And I think we'll see through Hiwaka Ekanoa a requirement for, for good documentation and photo points is certainly one part of that. So sort of the, the thing I want to sort of finish on before I come back to, to that sort of summary slide I showed you at the start, what might, this is sort of thinking about the, um, both, both the uh, central Otago and then into the Southern Lakes area, what might be some of the species to think about? I think Karnica, the photograph top left is on the Pisa range. Um, it's a, a naturally regenerating Karnica stand with um, a thin dark totara growing through it. Uh, Totara was certainly been an important tree in those mid-elevation forests before humans came into New Zealand and, and central Otago. Um, Karnak is a really good nurse to help, help it come away um, and either through natural reversion and, and probably enrichment planting or restoration, you know, I think there are reasonable opportunities to restore um, Totara dominated stands. They'll be long term, it's not going to happen in a hurry, um, but they've got massive biodiversity values and I think they can also sequester reasonable amounts of carbon. Um, Corfi's had a bit of attention in the media. This is a photograph here, it's actually on a mid slope stand in the Cadrona Valley. Um, but there's been a lot of talk about what might have been the dominant vegetation cover along a lot of the rivers through central Otago. And people have suggested that Corfi probably played, played a really important role. And of course, Corfi is a, a really important tree for um, native biodiversity, too. A lot of um, um, you know, produces nectar. Um, it's really important food for bellbirds, for kataroo, for tuis. Uh, when it's flowering. It's a beautiful tree too. So it, it's certainly, um, I think, something um, that we should be thinking about in, in sites. Um, and I just put this bottom example. This is from Balmoral Station in, in the Mackenzie Basin where um, Andrew Simpson, some of you might know Andrew, um, has planted just, just a little small trial of his own back planting Totara into, into a Madagari sweet briar mix. And, and it's really nice thing that they're coming away and, and, and doing quite well. So, you know, also briar, sweet, um, sweet briar and Madagari could also be a good nurse within which to plant um, natives. And then moving up into the higher rainfall end, this is up the lake, this is up this area here around Lake Hawea, you know, where, where we've also got beach. And I, I think beach in higher rainfall environments, a soup beach are either on the sort of the southern side of central Otago or up here in, in the southern lakes area, you know, planting beach or facilitating beach spread, I think is a real um, potentially really exciting way to sequester carbon and get good biodiversity outcomes. And 
I was over at um, uh, Walter Peak um, looking at some of the plantings that Real Journeys have done there um, around um, the, the, the wharf area and the campground. And there's really, really good growth. I mean, there's, there's beach, beach saplings that are only four or five years old are getting up around three metres tall now. So I do think uh, beach in, in the right environment is a really potentially suitable um, species too. So really just to summarize, and um, I'm just on, on time now. So native plants do sequester carbon, it's slower than exotics, but there are these other win-win um, outcomes of natives, particularly around biodiversity conservation. And as, as Erica said, I think when the national policy statement comes in, uh, it's gonna be really hard to clear any natives anyway. Um, so I think working with those natives, trying to facilitate them to develop, you know, you, you can get an economic return um, from carbon out of that. And there might be other incentives as well. Um, so it's natural regeneration or restoration plantings, and, and I can't emphasize enough just how important um, it is to actually plan um, native management, or sorry, to plan managing native vegetation, whether it is regeneration or whether it is restoration plantings, and think about those factors that will limit it, uh, and then build it into your farm management planning um, process. So um, thank you very much, and um, hopefully um, that you, you found that a useful um, um, summary of some of the issues around natives. Thanks, David. You really blazed through that. You did a um, wonderful job, and um, that was yeah, that was incredibly insightful, and it was really valuable to see some of those um, photographic examples of of some of the restoration work that's been done, just to give us a feel for what's possible. So, um, thank you. Um, we'll just grab Erica and David back again, um, and just go through some of the questions. I'm not sure if Erica, you just want to um, address what you're seeing in the chat box, or don't want to read the questions out. No, I can. I've noted them down, so we can hopefully save some time and let, let some more come through if there is. Um, so, does tussock, uh, presumably planted or regenerated since uh, 1990s, count as native? Um, no, no. Um, it is native. Um, we uh, for Hiwaki Economic, it rewards uh, woody vegetation, but there is tussock grass and has been identified as something um, for. Uh, early consideration once the system's up and running. So potential there um, for tussock. Soil carbon, is the regulator requiring measurement of soil carbon? No, soil carbon, um, there's still a lot of research being done to determine um, how much influence management has on soil carbon. Um, and how, so there's some information on the Waka Ikenau website about soil carbon. So I encourage you to have a look there on that. Um, uh, pre-1990 exotics that are in shelter belts, so weren't, um, didn't meet ETS definition, but do they, could they be rewarded under Hiwaki Kino? No, um, basically it has to be new um, or native and stock excluded. Um, uh, how much is remote sensing and UAV technology being used? Um, it's early days with that, so there's some really um, significant hope on the horizon that that will come into play, um, potential for um, being able to map um, whole areas and just look at carbon stock change between years, uh, which, would be, which would be great and we'd be able to be rewarded for a lot more, although we'd also have to pay for a lot more in terms of losses. Um, but yeah, so watch the space. Uh, Hiwaki and I have flagged that um, tech has a huge role to play, um, particularly with sequestration. So, uh, and then there was one very quick question, and maybe um, which is quite an important one, which is what other options are there for sheep and beef farmers other than sequestration? I have a slide on it, Nicola, but um, I can either chuck that slide into my summary and you can send it out uh, with a link for more information, or I can um, chuck that up now, but conscious of time. Pack it up now. Okay. <laughs> You're all still hanging in there. You obviously have exactly. nothing better to do on your whatever. What is it? Monday night. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Yeah. Hopefully, you get technology working. Okay. There's not heaps of options. Um, there are some. Um, now the place to go to look at options to respond. Um, for greenhouse gases is a website called Ag Matters, um, agmatters.nz, um, and there's lots of really great information about both what you can do now, uh, what technology is coming and where it's at in terms of the science process. So there's stuff on soil carbon, there's stuff on the vaccine, there's stuff on the um, feed additives, 
Um, so it's a really good, um, good source of information. Um, so in terms of options for sheep and beef farmers, that I've got here general efficiency of the system. The key thing that we're trying to do to reduce emissions is reduce feed eaten. If we, so anything we can do in our policy, uh, our farm stock policies to reduce feed eaten, um, then that will reduce emissions. You may decide to um, finish animals faster, for example, which may actually lead to more feed eaten, but uh, you might produce more of it or, um, or get animals off faster, so your income increases, so your ability to pay increases. So that might be a choice that you make. But if everyone does that, if everyone ups production to be able to pay, uh, the price will go up. So we won't be able to do that for very long. So it is that's why I've talked about system analysis to make sure you're understanding the relationship between emissions, feed eaten, and profitability and finding that sweet spot for your business and your objectives. Um, so we're going to have to redefine efficiency. If an action increases feed eaten, it won't reduce emissions, it will increase them. Um, so we want re resource use efficiency, basically producing more from the same or less. Um, uh, in our farm, we've, we've done a lot of work over the last few years that has uh, basically intensified production. Um, we've done lots of good stuff for the environment what it's been is our emissions per unit of product have gone down quite a lot, like we're, we're doing really well on that, uh, but our total emissions have gone up. So we're gonna have to, to work quite hard to now reverse that and still try and make some money to pay the man uh, or the bank. Um, so looking at stocking rates and what classes you've got, nutrient management does come into it, but generally those of us on sheep and beef farms are not, not big nitrogen fertilizer users. Um, so it's like pressuring around the edges generally for nutrient management, but if you are using a lot of nitrogen fertilizer, um, that's potentially somewhere you can uh, make some gains. So grow more clover and you'll be sweet. I know that's easier said than done, um, but I'm a consultant, so I get to just say stuff and you guys have to make it work. Um, the other great option that we've got is uh, low methane sheep. Um, this is pretty much the only tech bit of tech um, on the market at the moment. So you can test rams now. Uh, in fact, I think, I believe the trailers are working through the South Island at the moment. Um, you can get your rams tested. They go into a chamber. There's quite a protocol to get them into the chamber. Um, they test uh, and give you hopefully a distribution um, and then you can select for low methane rams. Um, and with a bit of luck, soon you'll be able to buy low methane rams from your ram, briar, um, ram breeder as well. So that's quite exciting. There's some, some pretty good potential there. Um, they're working on cattle now, although the dairy industry is leading that. So it could be a wee while before it comes uh, filters into the beef industry. Um, I'm not volunteering to uh, go into a chamber with any deer anytime soon. So I wouldn't be holding out much hope if you're deer on genetics just yet but hopefully um, genomics or something else might help us there. Um, there's uh, some evidence coming through around low emission feeds, um, feeding uh, sheep on rape crops, for example, for a period of six weeks will lower their, um, their annual emissions. Um, so that you may have opportunities there with, uh, that's to do with protein content of feed um, and duration. Um, and then your, um, then you're into planting trees and land use diversification, uh, which is getting rid of animals. So I've tried to avoid uh, promoting that, but um, but looking at, at options there is definitely um, something to consider. There we go, that's the whirlwind tour of options. <laughs> well done, Erica, you've done really well. And I see there's a few more questions coming in. I think yeah. most of them we've kind of, you've kind of addressed and we will do a newsletter after this event which will summarise some of the key learnings um, and hopefully that'll help to clarify some of those questions. Um, I'm just having a quick look at them now. I'm not sure if you can see them, Erica. Um, yeah, um, stock exclusion by natural boundaries, yes. Um, you might have to fill in some gaps. Just I'm um, speed reading that. So um, yes, and yes, high country category uh, farmers have hundreds of hectares in this category. So we have specifically looked at um, high country environments. David and I, David's been helping me with that piece of work 
Um, so there, there will hopefully be a pathway for high country um, that may not require a fence. That's cool. Um, do you want to just expand very briefly on Farmax, how that can be used? Um, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so Farmax, um, for those that don't know, is a um, financial and feed model um, and it also includes greenhouse gases now, which is really useful. It does include sequestration, um, but isn't aligned with Hewak and I yet. So, um, so kind of that's useful, but that should be parked to the side. So um, Farmax basically can model a farm. So um, it is it is somewhat challenged by uh, by dryland environments, but um, but there are some good operators around that can do that. Um, so set up your farm in Farmax, then you can look at different policy options. Um, and the great thing about Farmax is at least lets you test um, different policy options from the safety of a computer. Uh, if you set it up well, you'll trust that it represents your farm system well. Um, and you can look at, for example, if I, um, if I got rid of my breeding cows and I bought in dairy grazers for a period of time, will that reduce my emissions? How, what impact will that have on my profitability and what impact will that have on my feed curve? So you can look at um, look at options that way. So um, it's really powerful tool, um, particularly when you're making big, significant long-term land use decisions um, that are going to have basic price in 2025. Cool. I think um, I thought we'd better wrap up now, given that we've gone a little bit over time. But um, that, it was a really valuable session, so I don't want to cut it short because um, it's great to have you guys on and talking to us. Um, I just want to just do a quick conclusion. Big thank you to Erica and David for um, giving up your evening to talk to us. Those were really excellent presentations and it was great to have your expertise um, on the subject. So it's great to see so many questions coming in. It's obviously a topic that farmers are really interested in, which is great. Um, thank you everyone for attending. I hope you found it useful. You obviously did given the, the number of questions. Uh, next week, we have got our final webinar for this series, which is um, top tips from your local rural professionals. So that's focusing on things that you can do now um, and using their expertise and knowledge, um, local knowledge from um, agronomists and fertilizer consultants as well. So that'll be a really good session. It's this time next week. Um, if you want to sign up to that again on the Beef and Lamb events page, Opportunities Expo, and just scroll down to top tips from your local RPs. Um, that is all from me. Thank you all for attending um, this evening, and hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs>